Without any further ado, let me introduce Dr. Professor Hal Varian. He is a uh, is a is is a is a, 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 a really a member of the family. He grew up in, and was born in uh, Ohio, and like me from the Midwest, uh, spent some time doing uh, blue collar jobs, which uh, hopefully was as influenced as uh, the, the things we'll talk about today. But then he went on to uh, MIT. He did a degree in economics there, then went to here, back to Berkeley, has a master's in mathematics and then PhD in economics. Uh, he has taught a number of these institutions, including uh, MIT, Stanford, University of Oxford, University of Michigan. He's got a number of honorary degrees. He came back here as founding dean of our School of Information, uh, which is when I first uh, met him. And uh, he has, has been written best-selling textbooks in economics and also a, a best -selling, two best-selling books more general, for general audiences, but Information Rules, A Strategic Guide to Network Economy, and The Economics, economics of Information Technology and Introduction. And then he was lured away by uh, Google in 2002, the early years, and became their chief economist, where he continues to this day. And it, basically providing critical insights into all aspects of, of Google and their, their, their businesses and their impacts more broadly on, on, on the economy globally. So he's extremely, um, extremely respected. He's always interesting. And, um, but today his topic will be on um, the variance theorems. He's going to be uh, talking about fair allocation of homogeneous divi divisible resources, and particularly uh, when there exist Pareto efficient NV free allocations. So please welcome Hal Varian. <laughs> OK. So that last part wasn't really accurate. <clears throat> I uh, originally titled this presentation Automation and Procreation, but then I decided that was a little pretentious, so instead I'm calling it bots and tots. <clears throat> and the idea is there's this very threatening bot over here. There's a countervailing factor, namely a lot of demographic forces at work, which I think uh, people don't take into account enough when they think about the future of work. So here's Econ 101. Uh, economics of the labor market, there's demand for labor, there's supply of labor, there's some equilibrium level of employment and wage. And automation probably will reduce the demand for labor by substituting for uh, robotics and various forms of AI and machine learning and all this stuff we read about in the press. But the other side is we're going to see reduction in the supply of labor and that's simply because of demographics. Uh, the aging society, the play out of the baby boom, and a few other factors that are uh, at work. And so we can expect to see less work in the future. I think that's right, but of course that's what people want. Everybody wants more jobs and less work. And technology can provide that, as we see in this uh, diagram. And what happens to the wage is ambiguous because it's going to depend on the interplay between the demographic forces changing the supply and the uh, the uh, electronic forces, the digital forces changing the uh, demand. So that's what I'm going to discuss in the, next, uh, in the next 40 minutes or so. The supply comes from the tots and the demand comes from the bots and we'll see how it work, all works out. So we'll start with the bots. We want to talk about uh, the job stealing. 2016 headline, smart robots could soon steal your job. Or go back to 1980, robots after your job. Or go back to 1960, they bid for big jobs in outer space. Or 1935, where in fact thinking machines are replacing the thinkers. Or we can go back even further, 1812, when there's a warrant poster out for people destroying looms. So this idea that robots or machinery would come along and steal your job, it goes way back, way back to the Industrial Revolution. But lately, there's a little bit of a counter theme here. Uh, we're seeing a, a re, uh, problem with the labor shortage, not a labor surplus. And I'm going to argue that that labor shortage is going to continue for some time into the future. And the first point I want to make is the economy can absorb shocks to the labor market. This has happened over many decades, as you can see, despite all this history I just showed you, in general, work week has gone down. So amount of work has gone down basically fallen in half. Uh, and uh, during that time, we become dramatically more prosperous. 
So in fact, clearly in the long run, the economy can absorb labor shocks, but even the relative short run, there's a number of examples. One is women entering the labor force. There was a huge increase in uh, participation in the labor force by women in the 60s and 70s. If you look at this chart, you see almost double, uh, almost twice as many men were in the labor force as women back in 1950. And then you fast forward and now it's about, I think, 85% uh, or so. So there's been a very, very big shock to the labor market with a huge number of new workers coming on stream. And in part, when you go back and look at the history, that's due to automation because it was the domestic automation of washing machines and vacuum cleaners and dishwashers and dryers and lawnmowers and on and on, on that freed up people to pursue out of the house uh, work in the, uh, in the labor force, the paid labor force. So automation had a very important effect in, that, in those cases. And the baby boomers. So here's a chart that shows you the baby dearth back in the 30s when the depression was on, the baby boom after World War II, the baby bust after that, and then the echo of the baby boom back in the uh, 80s and 90s. So if you just look at this chart, you can see there's really dramatic changes in the number of births, and then of course 20 years later or so, there's a demand, there's a very noticeable change in the supply of labor just from following the demographic, um, just from following the numbers. And really, despite my being an economist, I do have to admit there's really only one social science that can forecast accurately uh, a decade or two into the future, and that's demography. Because these patterns of birth, growth, you know, T dot equals one every year where you're older, and that's been true uh, since the beginning. Spreadsheet apocalypse. This is a nice one from the Wall Street Journal where we saw the rise of the spreadsheet and we saw a big drop in bookkeepers, accounting, and auditing clerks. But at the same time, that technology was very helpful to management analysts, financial managers, uh, analysts, accounts, and auditors, and the demand for those higher level use of data analytics increased uh, dramatically. And finally, here's a nice chart from the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics looking at videotape and disc rental. They had a whole category of employment for that, and we saw what it looked like, 150 so, 150,000 uh, employees back in uh, uh, 2007, and now, of course, it's dropped to almost nothing. So we've had many shocks to the to labor force. Demographic shocks, women entering the labor force, the baby boomers, we've had different kinds of technological shocks, and we can expect this to happen uh, in the future as well. Now, if you try to look at understanding how the labor market works, it's very important to think in terms of tasks. As automation typically doesn't eliminate jobs, it eliminates dull, tedious, and repetitive tasks. So think about washing clothes, which occupied a huge amount of labor, really a dramatic amount of labor, mostly within the household, drying dishes, mowing lawns, digging holes, all that stuff, or cognitive tasks like making change or memorizing maps, adding columns of numbers up, and so on. And it's true that if you eliminate all the tasks that are associated with a job title, you've eliminated a job, but that is very, very rare. So in 1950 U.S. Census, they had 270 detailed occupations listed, and you had to pick one of those occupations. Since then, only one, only one of those jobs has actually been eliminated by automation. You might think a minute for which job that is. There's the picture, elevator operator. We don't have many, there's still a few, we don't have many elevator operators anymore. Uh, but at one point, pretty much every building with a few stories had an elevator operator. Uh, and their job consisted of a number of tasks other than just moving that lever back and forth to raise and lower the, the uh, elevator uh, in the shaft. You know, it's not a bad business, the elevator business. It has its ups and downs, but... <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, 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 that's... Only one of my two jokes, so we'll, leave, we'll say the other. You've got something to look forward to. Um, the other thing, besides operating the elevator, they were safety monitors. They were security monitors. They greeted people with a cheery hello. They provided answers to questions, provided services to residents, delivered boxes to doors on non-special prices or offers in department stores. 
And if you think about it, many of those tasks are still around. You walk into a tall building in San Francisco and there'll be security people there, there'll be people who answer questions, there'll be people that say hello. So those tasks have shifted into different occupations and become part of whatever security guard or greeter occupation, no longer tied to this particular job, which was an amalgam of tasks such as the ones I just described. So most jobs are more complicated than we think, especially intellectuals. We think the that, oh, it's simple to be a truck driver or somebody who uh, works in a fast food store. It's one of those things. They're actually much more complex. And the place to dive into this is to go to ONET, O-STAR-NET, which is a publication from the Bureau, Department of Labor that looks at different occupations and what the tasks are that are associated with those occupations. So I took a groundskeeper, which is you know, a garden worker, a person who mows your lawn and that kind of stuff, but they do a lot of things. It's not just the case that they mow the lawn and trim a couple of shrubs. They do all of the kinds of things on this. And in fact, it goes on and it goes on. There's about 35 different tasks associated with being a groundskeeper. And if you ask yourself, we have an expert right here, how many of those tasks could be automated? Well, if you look at any given task, you said, yeah, with some work and a research project and several million dollar budget over five or 10 years, we could probably automate that task, but it's very hard to think of being able to automate all 35 of the tasks that go into being a gardener. So we can expect it's going to be easier in the future because there'll be robotic lawnmowers, just like there are robotic uh, vacuum cleaners now, but it's unlikely, I think very unlikely, that in the near future we would see uh, all of those tasks being uh, eliminated. What fraction of jobs can be automated? Well, it depends on who you ask. There's a high of about 45% from Oxford, Pricewaterhouse, OECD, ITIF, I guess that's the International Federation of Robots. No, that's not it. IT, I'm not sure what that one is. Forrester, McKinsey, and so on. You see many, many different views. And actually, this is just a short summary. Uh, Technology Review came out with a table of everything they could find for the impact of automation on the job market, and the numbers are just all over the place because realistically, we're all just speculating on this, and so we're speculating about how much money is put into developing some of these tasks, and uh, what fraction of the tasks that are associated with various kinds of work can in fact be automated. Now right now, the 10 largest occupations in the US, it's an interesting list, retail salesperson, number one, and we expect to see some automation of that. Cashier, food preparation, general office clerk, registered nurse, customer service, et cetera. 80% 80, 80 of, the, of the labor market is working in services, and if you look at this list of jobs, most of them are services, right? And those jobs, just those 10 categories, account for 21% of total employment. And the only category that pays higher than the median Wage is, in fact, registered nurses, which make on average about 70,000 a year. Median wage is about 47,000 in the US. Food service workers at the bottom make about 20,000 a year. So we look at those jobs and we think, to what extent uh, can those be automated? And in, to what extent would it make sense to try to automate those jobs? Now, the work week, very important point. I mentioned earlier, everybody wants more jobs and less work, and basically, that's what technology's delivered. Back in 1850, we had 66 or 70 hour work weeks, especially if you worked on a farm. The cows didn't take vacation on Saturday, Sunday, or any time, for that matter. And in fact, if you look at uh, work week gradually decreasing, took a big jump there around 1900, and now in the US, we have a 38 hour work week. Okay, so that's pretty good. But it varies dramatically across space. In the Netherlands, that has the shortest work week in the developed uh, economies, 29 hours work per week. That's one whole day less than we work here. And part of that is they put some social institutions, labor market institutions, tax institutions in place to allow for a lot more part-time jobs. Again, particularly uh, among uh, women, so typically you'll see a far higher number of part-time jobs in, uh, in 
uh, European countries than here. Mexico is at the top in the OECD, 45 hour work week. The United States is kind of in the middle at 38.6. In fact, lots of people think in the US we're working too hard. Well, we'll see. Ah, Japan, I couldn't fit the list on, but uh, it's, in, it's, in, it's in the report. Click on the link and you can find the Japanese. Um, what do people want? More jobs and less work. That's what technology delivers. I already mentioned that. And let me turn to the topic of education and training, which is critical. A lot of interest in being able to do that more effectively. If you look at the classification that labor economists use in jobs, we look at routine, non-routine, and then we look at cognitive and manual. And here's a chart of what employment looks like in non-routine cognitive, routine cognitive, routine manual, and so on. And you see <coughs> non-routine cognitive, that has grown dramatically. If you look at non-routine manual, that's grown significantly. Uh, the problem is those two categories in the middle, routine cognitive, routine manual. And so the question is, how can you uh, improve the functioning of uh, the employment level in jobs um, or people that are working in, in those categories. If you look at unemployment rate and earnings by educational attainment, this is a nice chart from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the unemployment rate among doctor degree holders is 1.6%, right? Um, and the weekly earnings are substantial. Professional degrees, same, same employment, level and the uh, median work work weekly earnings are slightly higher. If you go down to somebody with less than a high school diploma, then you've got a much, much different uh, story. So clearly the education and the compensation are uh, tied together quite uh, tightly. And how can you change that? Or do you want to change it? Because you've also got a problem. There's what economists call a fallacy of composition for education. It's good for any individual to be more educated. We see that just from those previous charts. But is it actually necessary or appropriate for everyone to become more educated? It's certainly possible to have a society where the, ma the match between the educational attainments on the supply side of labor are not aligned with the demand for uh, various kinds of skills and jobs and tasks. Um, and that is a problem in some countries. Now, the best way to acquire job skills is on the job. Why? Because it's a lot cheaper. You don't have the opportunity cost. Right now, if you have to go off the job to acquire an education, that's going to be very costly because you're sacrificing the earnings that you would have made otherwise. And in lots of cases, the on-the-job training is much, much more relevant, more focused, and of course, people are highly motivated. My brother had a heating and cooling business. And every time Carrier came up with a new model of air conditioner or furnace, his employees would rush off to go take uh, uh, the course, the one-day course on how to install, how to repair, how to deal with that new model. They were very, very highly motivated to acquire that education. And they probably wouldn't be quite as motivated to go take a class in algebra or Latin or uh, something like that. So the question we need to think about is, can technology help deliver those on the job uh, skills. It used to be that being a cashier meant you had to know how to make change. You had to know arithmetic. It's not necessary anymore. The machine calculates the uh, change. It used to be a writer required knowing how to spell. Thank God they don't have that requirement anymore, <laughs> but I'll, or at least I'd be in trouble. Taxi driver meant you had to know the city streets. A hospitality worker, you had to know a little bit of a foreign language. If you're a gardener, you had to recognize plants. And a veterinarian had to recognize breeds of dogs and cats. All of those things are gone now. Those particular skills are not necessary for the job classifications I described. And what happens is you have your mobile phone or your electronic device that can make change, it can spell check for you, can navigate around city streets, and so on. And that's something I refer to as cognitive assistance, widely used term, actually. And if you think about it, when there's a gap in skills between what the worker has and what the employer wants, there's two ways to close that gap. You can actually raise the skill of the worker, or you can reduce the need for that skill uh, by the uh, person who's doing the hiring. And in fact, it's not really 
terrible, some people think it is, but I don't think it is necessarily, that uh, we now have all these calculating machines and we can do calculations of all sorts without having to uh, be able to do them by hand. When I was a kid, I don't, I don't know if they still do this. Do they teach you how to take a square root by hand anymore? You learned. I learned it. No, kids are learning. Yeah. Kids are learning it now. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's not clear to me that's a good idea. <laughs> and cognitive assistance, when you think about it, it's like manual assistance was uh, 100 years ago because we got these machines, these tractors, these winches, these gasoline engines, all this stuff that basically made people a lot stronger in the sense that they could lift much bigger things, haul much bigger things, do all that kind of amplification of the uh, muscular power that a human being had by providing that uh, physical assistance. Well, now we're in an age where we can apply all sorts of cognitive assistance in the same way. And I claim that access to training these days is phenomenally better than it's ever been historically, in part because of YouTube. Every day there are 500 million views per day of, on YouTube of how-to videos. Okay, and that's of course our friend in the Cognitive Acad uh, uh, Academy. Uh, all sorts of mathematical skills, all sorts of computer science skills, all sorts of technical skills. But not just that. There's also all of these manual skills: how to sweat copper pipe, how to install a prehung door, how to do planks, how to bake a souffle, how to paint with watercolor, how to play the guitar, on and on and on. And everybody has access to those educational materials anytime they want, anywhere they want. So YouTube, in my view, should be a very important part of the educational establishment because it's a way to deliver education and training uh, that we've never been able to do before in such a mass market way. Okay, I've got 10 minutes and I can summarize the bots with these bullets. Demand for labor and supply for labor are both important. I'm not going to read them to you. Uh, I think those are very important issues to keep in mind when you look at the uh, uh, bot side of things. Let's go to TOTS, or demography. Productivity in economics is output per hour times hours per worker times workers per person. We call that productivity, employment, and participation. And what's been happening to those? Well, we're at full employment. Pretty much in most places, the U.S. now, 4.2%. 4, 4 uh, we are, see, declining participation. Largely that's demographic due to the aging of the population and those baby boomers choosing to retire. But there are other things going on uh, as well. And, of course, productivity, the output per hour, has been very anemic. And we economists don't quite know why. Some of it's measurement, some of it's deployment of technology, lots of things like that, but that's a whole other uh, talk in, its, in itself. So the problem is if we want more output per person, we can't get more employment realistically. The participation rate is going down for clear reasons, and uh, the productivity growth we don't really know how to fix. Productivity, when you look at it, has been, grew at a relatively slow rate from 73 to 93. Then it picked up in the 90s. And a lot of people attribute that to computerization, the PC and so on. But for the last uh, decade or so, it's gone back to being very, very slow. Here are those three periods when we saw pretty slow growth in the 70s, rapid growth in the 90s, and then back down to relatively slow growth again. But now let's turn to the labor force. If you look at the labor force, this is a growth by decades from the 50s to 2005. The next decade, the labor force is growing by the smallest amount ever since World War II. Very, very slow rate of growth. And in fact, if it weren't, well, I'll show that side. Well, no, I want to wait. Uh, if it weren't, if it turns out if it weren't for immigration, you'd see an actual decline in the labor force in the, uh, in the US. But every one of those baby boomers who retires expects to continue consuming. So somehow the economy has to produce the things that those people who aren't in the labor force are going to consume. And that means we have to have increased productivity in order to do that. And that means essentially we need to have uh, more mechanical assistance, more use of labor saving devices, including robots and uh, artificial intelligence. 
you look at this chart below, you see the population on the left-hand side growing at a nice steady rate, and you see the, the labor force on the right-hand side that's growing at about half the rate of the population growth, okay? And if you look at where this is worst in the U.S., it's basically the upper Midwest. And if you look at places like Texas and Nevada, Utah, they're doing okay in terms of demographics. But if you look at the northern part of the U.S., it's doing pretty badly in terms of the demographics. And when you see the evening news where the lady says, all the kids have left town and there's nobody here to restock the grocery stores, that's pretty much right. You know, we've seen this big shift in migration, but it's mostly been among a much younger uh, cohort. And if it weren't for immigration, well, I think I mentioned this a minute ago, we'd see the labor force actually uh, falling in the U.S. And we are in good shape compared to the rest of the world. Okay? If you look at the rest of the world, we see a situation here where Japan, Korea, Germany, Spain, Italy, France, they all have a problem with declining labor force, and this would occur uh, partly, I mean, this is, this is occurring partly due to uh, immigration issues, but it's also, to a large extent, very large extent, having to do with the uh, population aging I just referred to. If you look at the countries that have the most robots per worker, Guess what? It's South Korea, Japan, Germany, Italy, Sweden, and so on. Exactly the same countries. If you follow the news about Japan, you mentioned Japan a few minutes ago, uh, they are having an extremely difficult time doing with the, dealing with this uh, essential fall in the labor force, uh, the reluctance to allow immigration, and they are really forced into uh, relying very heavily on automation of pretty much everything. If you look at China, the one-child policy in China is disastrous from a demographic perspective because what it means is you'll have a much smaller labor force in the future, and the Chinese are, of course, investing very, very heavily in both robotics and artificial intelligence just to prepare for what's going to happen uh, 10 or 15 years down the road. The labor force participation rates I've shown you here are declining, U.S., growth in population. U.S. labor market is already beginning to tighten, and we can expect a tight labor market for the next 25 years, essentially. And that's just looking at the demographics, okay? Retirees are consuming. The old intuitions we have are no longer helpful because we had two very big shocks to the economy uh, 30 years ago, and that was women entering the labor force and the baby boomers entering the labor force. So we've lived through a period where there's been a general supply of labor has been available and now we're entering a period that's exactly the opposite, where the uh, supply is not going to be available, but the demand will be there. So from the viewpoint of technology, my view is that the uh, robots are coming along just in time. Because if we don't manage to find a way to increase output <coughs> to support all of the fraction of the population that's not working, then we're going to really have a lot of social and economic uh, difficulties. So, oh yes, and there's the other side, which is healthcare. All of this has been just about looking at people who are not working. They've withdrawn from the labor force due to some reason. But of course, the older people get, the more costly they get in terms of healthcare. And if you look at the people over 65 in the US today, there's about 46 million, but by 2060, there's going to be twice as many. 98 million. You look at the people with Alzheimer's today, 5 million. There's no cure found. Uh, 30 years from now, there'll be again, almost three times as many. So you have really uh, severe issues, not only from just normal participation in the labor force, but also what happens as you have this aging, uh, aging population. There's a recent report for the Department of Labor on uh, employment gains by occupation. And if you look at this in light of the, the technology and demography story I've been telling, this is pretty much what it looks like. One newspaper headline summarized this by saying, the demand is all for nerds and nurses. So there you go. Uh, personal care aides, registered nurses, home health aides, medical assistants, and so on, software developers as well. And if you, if you don't manage 
to deal with this kind of shock to the labor force, you're going to be in a very uh, difficult situation. And so I'll end on that note. The note is, if we do nothing, then uh, it's a pretty pessimistic story, but actually the things that you can do in terms of impacting both the supply and demand for labor uh, can be very helpful. I'll stop there. Thank you. You didn't, uh, you didn't prove uh, Varian's theorems today, <laughs> but, um, but a, a absolutely a wonderful alternative perspective from what you've been seeing in the headlines lately. So I want to open it up for questions, but before we do, we have a very special guest here today. Max Newfield is, a, is a minister from the Ministry of um, Employment in Germany, and he's come here to talk with us to, to, to provide perspectives of what, what they're seeing over there. He's, uh, he's got a background. He's been educated at the UK and Switzerland, and uh, he's a PhD in political economy. So I would like to invite him to may say a few words and kick off the, uh, the Q&A session. So, Max? Uh, thank you so much. Okay. Um, so a ver very brief reflection from a, from, from a German perspective, which is basically uh, underlining the, uh, the argument uh, Hal just made. Um, I, I also think, and I think like the German government also also thinks that um, in the medium term, um, a lack of skilled labor is the bigger problem than uh, automation. I, f I fully agree. Um, although I, I think that um, it's very likely that we are going to see both um, at the same time. So technology-induced unemployment um, and skilled labor shortages. And when we look at the, the German case, even with the recent influx we had um, of, of refugees, the labor force in Germany will peak around 2020 and then uh, decline, quite, decline quite, quite rapidly. I think it's important analytically to differentiate two different dimensions of uh, securing um, skilled labor. The one is a quantitative one, and the second one is a, a qualitative one. And Germany made some decent progress uh, with regard to the quantitative one, which is female labor uh, market uh, participation, um, skilled labor immigration, and also reducing uh, structural long-term unemployment. Um, but this means that there's little more to do with regard to increase the number of, of noses, so to say, right? So um, what we have to do now is to approach the, the qualitative dimension, um, which is a constant development of skills and capabilities of those noses we, we increased. Um, and that's a lot harder to, to achieve from a governance perspective because um, the measures you have to take go beyond taxation and regulatory issues, but um, largely have to play out um, at the workplace level, which is hard far more difficult to do um, from a policymaker perspective. And um, I think there is a quite crucial role for technology to play. Um, first of all, I think monitoring and predicting the, the development and development potential of individuals at the company level, but also ideally at a, at a um, company, uh, industry and national level um, is is, is a big challenge when we look at Singapore, for example, that's what the Singaporeans are doing. So actually tracking the human capital investment of each individual to see what, what is working, what is not working. And secondly, I think there's also a massive role for technology to play uh, with regard to building, learning and capability friendly uh, working environments. And we had all this debate in the 1980s actually about different kind of concepts. How do you, how do you increase the learning friendliness of, of workplaces, um, but not so much implementation. So all the debate we had, for example, about high performance work practices, we don't really know that much about the diffusion. There's only like anecdotal evidence. Um, and I think what we have to do now, the question is how do you organize this um, to, radical, to radically uh, redesign um, work organization to contribute to, to individual uh, development? And um, this could be this concept we developed in the, in the 1980s. And um, the question is, I mean, when, when you take a German manufacturing worker, which could be conceived as um, routine work. It is quite a lot of embodied knowledge. And the question is, how do, you, how, how do you build a system where tasks are given to a person that are maximum, that they are to a maximum uh, extent contributing to the redevelopment of, um, of this person? And I think there's a massive role to play for, for technology. We don't have these uh, technologies yet, and that's what we would like to see in the future. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Your questions. Please put your hand up if you have a question, and then we'll one and wait in the back. Do we have another mic? We have a couple mics. Okay, good. There you go. Hi. Um, you mentioned that there was this uh, decrease in supply and demand. Do you know if the decreases are happening for the same types of jobs? Yeah, it's uh, it's 
differ if you, if you look at, I, I had some slides in there about this, but I took them out for, for time. You see this kind of polarization in the economy. There's been an increase in the demand for highly skilled workers. We're all aware of that. But at the same time, there's also been an increased demand for low skilled workers. Okay, even the restaurant workers that we're talking about, very low paid. But you walk by, walk down a street in San Francisco or in Berkeley, and you'll see signs on the windows looking for dishwashers and cooks and cleaners and all sorts of uh, those things. And, and that is really the, the fact that we're just seeing a reduction in the supply of labor, partly for demographic reasons, partly for immigration reasons, a few other things. The middle jobs that require some training but are largely repetitive, those are the ones that are being handled by uh, automation. Think about the assembly line, for example. We spent 100 years optimizing the assembly line, making a person at each station do a very specific, well-defined, clear task. And it's not at all surprising that now half of the industrial robots in the world are in automobile plants because there's a very high degree of substitution be some, between somebody doing a repetitive manual task and the kinds of things that a robot can uh, fairly easily do. So we'll see more of that. The manual, non -routine, the manual routine tasks, those will be uh, automated and the challenges dealing with the other side. But it's not just the higher educated people. It's also going to be demands for relatively uh, low skilled people who can learn uh, tasks that would be helpful like the gardening example or like the uh, food worker example and so on. You know, I like to say I've, I've actually held the four worst jobs in America because I grew up on a farm, so I was an agricultural worker. And then in high school, I worked in a Dairy Queen, so I was a fast food worker. And then one summer, I worked uh, for Timken Roller Bearings, making ball bearings in a factory. And then I was a dean at Berkeley. Uh. <laughs> yeah. so, you know, I, I know there are some people in the audience who can identify with that. Another dean. <coughs> thank, thank you for your very insightful talk. I found your point about the impact of immigration on the workforce very interesting. And so I wanted to ask, what do you think will be the impact when and if the DACA work permits expire early this year? Yeah. So I don't think they will have an immediate impact on the employment side of things, my guess, or maybe I should say my hope is that there will be a, a deal reached on that. And I, I think that's widespread when you look at the public opinion polls. But I don't think it has a lot to do with the uh, labor market economics I've been talking about right now. Yes. Is in the... Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. So uh, I just want to come back to uh, the education problem. You said that uh, now it's really easy for everybody to have access to knowledge through uh, YouTube or other like Coursera. And st so I wonder what that was something initially done by universities. So what will be the role of universities in the future? Well, it, it's a good question. Uh, I I think that the learning materials for both the cognitive stuff, the university stuff, and the manual labor stuff are available now, which is really quite remarkable. Universities focus on cognition, obviously, but even uh, manual skills are readily uh, accessible, and I think that's gotta have a big impact on the labor market. Now, with a lot of people, as anybody who's taught at a college university, a lot of the things involve motivation and getting the right help at the right time and helping to direct people's studies. And these are not things that are going to be automated on YouTube. These are things that I think really have to be done by human beings. But they can certainly draw on those resources that are available now in ways it was just uh, impossible to do before. I, I guess I'll hit my you mentioned a, there, there were a number of monetary figures that you put up there, and they seem to m most often be expressed in terms of, of a mean rather than, say, distribution. Uh, and, and I think of, of, of distributional aspects as, as really contributing to the senses of, ec of societal equity, uh, particularly you mentioned the figure, the, the uh, prevalence perhaps of part-time work in, in Denmark currently, and that figure back in 1850, how much of what kind of a sense of equity of, in that labor, that ag agricultural labor market was there with slavery existing. So to, to what extent do, do distributional aspects uh, affect uh, 
what sort of dynamic is at play there? Yeah. Well, I do think that our perception of distribution has evolved during this period that I described earlier, where there was basically surplus labor available, or there was lots of workers available, and it was they were all kind of on the wrong side of the uh, of the negotiation. And I'm much more optimistic about the future, where we have, in my view, higher levels of employment and wage pressure that's pushing wages up. Now, I can't say that definitively now, but when you look at the statistics, it certainly looks different than it looked uh, uh, several years ago. And we may be entering a period where we'll see a lot more uh, focus on lifting the entire ship as opposed to just lifting uh, parts of it. So I'm optimistic for the future. We'll see what happens. All right, keep our fingers crossed. Who's next? Uh, hi. On the theme of distribution uh, and inequality, it partly depends not just on the labor market, but on what's getting more efficient. And so uh, capitalism rewards innovation for prosperous people. So. I'm one of the few people in the room who thinks male pattern baldness is an important problem, and, and so does capitalism, so that's awesome. Um, <laughs> but as inequality has risen so far, it's going to push towards solving problems for prosperous people, which on the price side, not the labor market, can make things worse. There are spillovers, right? Android phones are cheap, even when iPhones make all the money. But uh, are there ways to tilt it more egalitarianly uh, in the in the product market or services? Well, on the, on the inequality front, if you look at income inequality, of course, there's no doubt that it's increased significantly. If you look at after tax, after transfer inequality, it's grown by less. And if you look at consumption inequality, it's grown by uh, significantly uh, less than uh, the growth in, in income inequality. And part of that is that many of the technological innovations that we've had in the last uh, decade or two have become very, very cheap. So you mentioned mobile phones. So that, those were just toys for rich people. Or flat screen TVs. Again, those were only affordable by the very wealthy. I remember when Bill Gates built his house, there were flat screen TVs that cost $10,000 each that uh, projected uh, paintings. And now anybody pretty much has access to that. So I. I uh, I think Ken may have alluded to what uh, people have called Varian's uh, uh, law, namely what rich people have now, middle class people will have in uh, seven or eight years, and poor people will have another uh, few years after that. So on the consumption side, I think we are really seeing uh, some, Im some improvement. Yeah, thank you. Um, you mentioned that in the medium term, if anything, there, there'd be a shortage uh, of labor, so that's a positive story uh, for us. Um, but I, I, I can imagine that there's still, in the short term, there's a bump we kind of have to get over first. And I, I think actually Germany and the auto manufacturer industry in Germany is a good case study of that, where there has been a lot of job replacement in the, in the auto factories, but because the German unions, labor unions are so strong, they've been able to force companies to mitigate that effect and take care of the um, workers that are no longer necessary. Um, I was wondering, do you think, is there a similar short-term risk in the US where labor unions are not as strong? And is there, is there a different coping mechanism? So I think one of the important distinctions between the German labor market and the US labor market is um, the diversity of income, poverty levels, union strength, et cetera, across the country. So if you look at the US automobile industry, it was centered around Detroit or in Ohio, the upper Midwest, for a long time. They had quite a bit of power. Then when the Japanese came into the market, they didn't locate in Detroit or Cleveland or the upper Midwest. They located in Kentucky and Tennessee. And the new US automakers found themselves forced, really, by competition to locate in similar places where wage rates were lower and the union power was much less. In Germany, as I understand it, uh, a lot, most of the negotiations are taking place at the national level when you don't have that particular ability to move to low-cost areas within the country, although, of course, you can move internationally, and uh, companies are doing that in Europe, of course. Uh, that's uh, look at Spain, look at Portugal. 
there are places that have benefited to some degree from the, uh, you know, from the fact that they have a lower wage and, and uh, you know, very much along the lines of the U.S., but not nearly as extreme as, as we'll, we've seen in the United States uh, industrial history. Um, um, hi, Liz. Um, I have a question about um, disappearing middle class. So I think there's a theory that um, going forward, we might start to see um, less people who work in the middle class more shift towards like either lower end or high end. So I don't know, um, in your study, when you look at labor market, do you see that automation will start to replace jobs more like in the middle, which you kind of touch on, and then people who lose jobs who used to get paid like middle class income, they may actually not want to shift to the lower end and they, they can't shift to the high end, right? So um, what, what do you think about that? What's your view on this theory of disappearing. Right, class. this idea of the hollowing out, we're having demand for highly educated and for minimally educated people in the middle class. Well, there is some data that says that has been going on. You've seen some examples. The charts I showed you with the non-routine cognitive, sorry, the routine cognitive, routine manual tasks. Uh, but my own view is that that's transient. I don't think that's something that's really going to Old in the long run, the period we're looking at here. This is something that's happened over the last decade or so, but uh, I think unlikely to persist. Yes? Uh, thank you. Um, uh, my question is about the productivity decline. It's, it's quite interesting. There's been a lot of people trying to describe why there's this decline in productivity. And uh, I think one of the reasons might be that the way in which value is measured today is not actually taken into account in the, in the way in which we measure productivity. And we have a lot of wealth being created which is not measurable in the way in which we measure GDP, for example. And some people talk, talked about happy degrowth, et cetera. Do you think that if we kind of try to change the way in which we measure wealth and productivity, we might have a different story to tell? To people? Well. This is a topic near and dear to my heart. I've actually uh, worked on this quite a bit, and I'll give you my favorite example, which is photography. So back in 2000, there were 80 billion photos produced in the world. We know that because there were only three companies that made film. Uh, they cost about 50 cents for film and developing. Now fast forward to 2015, and there were uh, 1.6 trillion photos taken in the world at a cost of essentially zero, so 20 times as many. Any non-economist would say, wow, what an incredible increase in productivity. Well, we have this little trick or a little uh, adjustment we do. We only measure goods that are priced, that are transacted in markets, and the vast majority of those photos are used by individuals or exchanged with their friends or all sorts of other stuff. There's really been no change, essentially, to the uh, commercial, non-commercial, uh, I mean, the, 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 the commercial side of things. But it's had a huge increase in what people do. I mean, they get a lot of enjoyment out of that. It's very important to have those photos. Uh, same thing with a GPS system. GPS systems start out, they're only for rich people. Well, they're only for companies originally and military. And then they came down $1,000, $900, $800, price went down, down, down. Real GDP went up, up, up because you were getting same quality of service or better service at a lower price right until the price hit zero and it came bundled with your smartphone. And at that point, no more productivity growth by definition, even though the capabilities have increased uh, dramatically. And if you think about the smartphone, the smartphone has replaced music players, cameras, GPS systems, uh, note-taking devices, what else, lots of other things. Those have all lowered GDP because you've seen the reduction in production of all these other items. They've been folded into the phone and there's no quality or hedonic adjustment for mobile phones in the US. So clearly, the output has gone up. It's been shifted in the form it's been delivered uh, but it doesn't show up in GDP statistics. So we're trying to fix this, but uh, it's a, you can imagine it can't be done overnight. You could just start charging for all that stuff, right? Yeah. Google. <laughs> Never mind. Um, <laughs> one last question. Um, you mentioned that skill building and education is necessary to decreasing the skill gap. And 
guaranteeing a more inclusive future of work. And you also said that the information is out there. And yeah. so my question to you is, what is the most effective way to guarantee that the people who need that education and skill building most are receiving it because they're not necessarily the same people who are using Coursera or watching the how-to YouTube videos? Yeah. Well, actually, I, I think we might uh, be nice to know the answer to that question. That's one of the things we're trying to find out at uh, Google. I was talking to one of the CEOs in Alphabet whose hobby is welding, and he was telling me what fantastic resources there are on YouTube if you want to weld. And you imagine welding is not just a hobby, it's actually a career, it's a job, it's something that requires skilled labor, and now we're able to deliver all of this content that can help people do better welding. And I think it's true across the board. You could look at cooking. You know, that's a job, certainly, that people are interested in. There's a huge amount of instructional material there. So are people taking advantage of it and we just don't know it? Or do they not know these capabilities are there and we could tell them about it? Or how could we fold this into not just the educational system, the Khan Academy, great as it is, but in the training system as well? Because I think there's a lot of great stuff there that could really be extremely valuable from an employment point of view. That is a very positive note to end on. Okay. Thank you, Hal. Sure. You're terrific. Thanks. Thank you all.